yeah so i've gone from believing well it might have been aliens it's not aliens it could be <laughs> fake i was not fake it seems pretty genuine so i'm not quite sure i'm i think i'm back to thinking it is an old book <laughs> Welcome to the Compendium, an assembly of reasons why I'm not saying it's aliens, but it might be aliens. Aliens? Is that is that a clue? It could be a clue. And t- for today's podcast. Yeah. Interesting. What do you think? Did it, did it strike you? Did, did, did it strike you with intrigue? It it did, yeah. Area 51 kind of vibes. Oh, is that what you got? Okay. Well, well, we'll, we'll, see. we'll have to see, yes. Yeah. I am Kyle Reesey. I am your trusty host and the only person on this podcast who can tie their own shoelaces without any help. I don't know what you're trying to say. And I'm Adam Cox, your co-host, and the only person willing to teach Kyle the difference between his left and right shoe. Oh, really? Mm. You're so horrible to me. You're rude to me. <laughs> so, Adam, how's your week been? It's been it's been good. Yeah, made last well, you know made it through another week. Yeah, um, been a busy week. Lots in the news and stuff like that. Oh, not a lot in the news. Why have you got some news for me today? Did you <laughs> did you finally manage to learn how to write a more convincing ransom note since last week's episode? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. It's, I'm still practicing. Okay, who's going to be your victim? Could be you. Oh, really? Could be you. You're going to ran- put me up for ransom? If you carry on like this. Oh, really? What do you mean? <laughs> I just tied my shoelaces all on my own without any help. Okay. How is your uh, fitness goals going this week? Uh, it's good. I've noticed the difference that I am more hungry. I'm growing more hungry by the day, I feel. Oh, really? It's getting worse, is it? I feel. I felt like, you know, it was fine. But I think because I've kept the same foods now for a while, mm-hmm. um, I'm, you know, sweet treats and stuff like that. I've, um, yeah, started to miss out. Miss them. And what's your goal weight? Are you, are you looking to get down to a particular goal weight? Or are you looking to just get stronger, more muscly? What's the deal there? Muscly? muscly muscular? Muscular. Um, it's a mixture of both. Um, you know, yeah. Physical fitness as well as sort of um, shape. But uh, yeah, I think I've got about 10 kilos to go, which feels quite a lot. Jeez. What, is there like a specific time range that you have to achieve 10 Six, kilos? 16 loss? weeks. Oh, that's manageable. Yeah, it's manageable, but yeah, I don't know if... over half a pound a week, unless I got my maths wrong. Half there. a kilo a week. Yeah, sorry, half a kilo a week. Yeah. Wow. So you're going to be felt like like you've been like uh, vacuum packed, vacuum sealed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if that's the look I'm going for, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. Okay, well, um, should we move on to uh, In Case You Missed It, which is a new segment of ours all about uh, this weekly news. So, and we have a really great, I don't know what you call it, is an acronym for it. So in case you missed it, I-C-Y-M-I. I-C-Y-M-I. No, it doesn't need to spell a word. No, why can't it just be I-C-Y-M-I? Ick me. (laughs) Yeah, ick me. me. So this week was all about, uh, of course, if anyone's been following the news, uh, President Biden visiting uh, the Ukraine. But bizarrely, the world... Um, appears to have overlooked some serious hard-hitting journalism this week. Uh, In case you missed it, did you catch that story about the bride who discovered her groom being breastfed by his mother on their wedding day and almost caused off the wedding? (laughs) What? So, what? (laughs) (laughs) So, this is the How, How did this happen? How did the bride discover him? That's it. Yeah. So, oh, right. uh, so there was this. So apparently, there is a sport. Let me read the story out. Okay. So, uh, to pre- so this is how it goes. It's one of those salacious kind of news columns. Do you know, like when you're like scrolling down on one of your news feeds and you get to the very bottom section of the kind of the feed where there's all the salacious clickbaity crap? Oh, yeah. The stuff that I do for my job. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the story. We might do a podcast on that. But, uh, <laughs> So basically, I was scrolling through that. And do you know what? I'm sick and tired of ignoring this. I'm going to embrace them as stories. I mean, that's where the real journalism comes from. But anyway, so the, the article began, prepare to be shocked and stunned by a wedding horror, by a wedding horror story that will make your draw, jaw drop. A wedding makeup artist known as Jenny, and that's just Jenny. Just Jenny. Just Jenny. Um, has shared a shocking incident that almost caused a bride to cancel her big day. Notice how she says, 
almost. So basically, this has happened because we've read the headline mm. and she's still got unmarried to this guy. Well, maybe there's an explanation, <laughs> a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. <laughs> it feels like there's a relay race where she's been handed over the baton. The mum's pulled her aside and she's had a little chat with her. She's come out. She's like, yep, fine. We're going to get married. And like, what was that conversation all about? But anyway, so the unfiltered, the unfiltered Bride podcast, which is where this story comes from, recently featured uh, this tale of horror narrated by a UK wedding planner, Georgina Mitchell. Now, Jenny had just finished preparing the bride's hair and makeup when she excused herself to use the bathroom. However, what she found was enough to make the bride reconsider her choice of groom. Oh, so it was Jenny who found it, yeah, the it makeup just... artist. Okay. So Jenny had walked in on her husband to be being breastfed by his own mother. At first, the host of the podcast assumed that the groom had been cheating on the bride uh, with another woman. But as Georgina revealed the truth, their shock and disbelief only intensified. Apparently, I didn't listen to this. I only just read it. But can you? Im- so it just goes on and on. Blah 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 goes on. Wow. Did you say where this where this couple was from? Sorry, did you? I have no idea. It's sound, I mean, Georgina Mitchell, that sounds like a very English name, I guess. I was just going to say, I mean, I uh, remember Little Britain. Yeah, and uh, yeah, then obviously it was based on it's kind of um, characters from all over Britain, quite extreme personalities. Hang and, on. Are you saying that's all rooted in some kind of reality to some degree? Well, it sounds like it now, doesn't it? That's so gross. Ew. Bitty. Bitty. Yeah. Anyway. I guess that's better than like the bride-in-law or like, no, the mother-in-law doing it that'd be weirder <laughs> right. at least why this is mum but the thing is though like why would first of all why would the mother-in-law still be hang on there's two things wrong with this statement first of all why would the mother-in-law still be lactating and because women only continue to lactate if they continue to breastfeed so she's been breastfeeding him throughout his whole life maybe they've had another child and you know just the pressure and the sun's st- i don't know the, i don't hang, know hang on the pressure of what but the milk in the breast i don't know i've okay. never been there myself. <laughs> no, no, neither have I. But anyway, that's um, that's in case you missed it. Case in case you missed it for this week. Um, so today's episode. In today's episode of the Compendium, we will be exploring the mystery of the Voynich manuscript, the cryptic text that has puzzled experts for centuries. Okay. So up until today, Adam, had you ever heard of the Voynich manuscript in any capacity whatsoever? Not one single bit. Really? Yeah. Well, so I read about this years ago, and at the time, I found it really compelling. I managed to download um, like a, like all the clippings from the entire book, the entire manuscript that someone had scanned in, and it literally has just been sitting in my photo library all of these years. And do you know, like, it pops up with some memories every so often. Yeah. So it's always taunted me, like, oh, by the way, five years ago, this happened, you downloaded it, do you remember the great memories? I'm like, I know nothing about this, but I'm still really intrigued. So it stayed in my photo library. And then the other day, I thought it would be a perfect ep- uh, opportunity to kind of create an episode for you to kind of tell you all about the Voynich manuscript. Voynich. So is this um, German? Um, so it's named after Wilfred Voynich, who's the guy that acquired it in the early turn of the century. Okay. So that's how it gets its name. So it's got nothing. The Voynich is just based on the person who who acquired it. Okay. But, yeah. Just to check, it is the Voynich, not Voynich. I'm going to say Voynich. We have to pick one thing, right? There's going to be a lot of things that I'm mispronouncing because there's a lot of names in this, this yeah. podcast. If we're wrong, we're wrong. We're, no, if I'm wrong, I'm right. Right. No, okay. wrong. <laughs> so the Voynich Manuscript is a mysterious document that has captivated researchers and the public for over a century. It is believed to be created in the 15th or 16th century, and the manuscript is written in an unknown language that contains illustrations that are equally as puzzling. Now, despite the numerous attempts to decipher its text and the illustrations, the purpose and the meaning of the manuscript is still unknown. Now, over the years, the Voynich manuscript has been associated with various fields, including cryptography, alchemy, and medicine. And some have also claimed that the manuscript holds the secrets to the universe. However, despite much effort, the script and illustrations of the manuscript remain largely undeciphered, and many questions about its purpose and meaning remain unanswered. 
Now, despite the lack of answers, the Voynich manuscript continues to be a subject of fascination and ongoing research and analysis. Um, and the Voynich manuscript provides new insights into the cultural and intellectual climate of the medieval and Renaissance Europe kind of era. Now, in this episode, we are going to take a closer look at the history of the mysterious Voynich manuscript, and we will explore some of the key theories about its origin, purpose, and of course, its meaning. Now, the Voynich manuscript is about 23.5 to 16.2 centimeters, which makes it roughly the size of a standard paperback. It is bound in what is thought to be calfskin, skin, um, but it's not the original binding, which is thought to have been rebound somewhere along its history. Now, there are some insect holes um, within the actual front and the back covers, um, which indicates that the original cover was made of some kind of wood with a tanned leather inside cover. Now, the book contains roughly 240 pages, although 30 pages are thought to be missing. Now, the pages are made of what is known as a high-quality vellum, which is a type of parchment that is made from animal skin, typically the skin of a calf or sheep. Uh, some of the pages are folded sheets of varying sizes, and the text and the drawings in the book are written in ink and painted in various colors, including green, brown, and red, and the manuscript is illustrated with a range of different images, including plants, stars, and, and various forms of people. And the script used in the book is completely unknown, is a completely unknown writing system um, with no known alphabet or decipherable code. And the book has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, although the identity of the author and of course, all the authors in this case, um, and its purpose is just completely unknown. Carbon dating is a way of determining the age of an object containing organic material by measuring the amount of carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope. Um, the age is calculated based on the rate in which the carbon-14 decays, and then they compare the amount of carbon-14 in the sample to the amount that remains in the atmosphere or is in the atmosphere. The less carbon there is, the older the sample is. And they can get pretty damn accurate. As I said, they got this accurate within like a, a, a 10 to 20 year kind of margin of error uh, because this is precisely dated between 1404 and 1438. And they're pretty confident that this is genuine. This is a real article. So you managed to kind of have a little bit of a play earlier today. What, what were your initial thoughts of it? So one, uh, it looked old, um, but I think... The thing that struck me most was one, it was a another language. I was trying to work out did I recognize any of the characters? And it, you know, there's the way that uh some of the characters look, it does look um almost like wingdings. Remember in, in Word? Oh, and stuff yeah. like that. It kind of it looks like something that just is not. A, do you legible. think a time traveler kind of from from today's period has anyone checked <laughs> has anyone checked that well i mean it is a theory might be wingdings two wingdings three um so that's so that's what i yeah obviously first struck me the second thing it reminded me of someone's science book at school where you would draw a flower and then you'd write about it or something or nature and stuff like that the way and initially i thought these uh, illustrations of flowers were, you know, um, real. But then as you kind of go through, you're like, no, that, that definitely doesn't look like anything that's interesting that, that I've recognized, which is kind of making me think linking back to this whole alien thing, because I thought they were very much like made up, you know, make up a flower. Um, yeah. Interesting. Did you, how far through the, the book did you get? Did you get past the, because of course the very first part, and we'll go through this in just a moment, is what looks like a botany section, but then it does kind of progress onto various other kind of types of sections like uh, like astrology and cosmology. Yeah, I I got I did go all the way through. I thought it looked a little bit like constellations or like horoscopes mm. in terms of like or calendar um, and how it was kind of. But then again, you don't recognize like uh, any horoscope symbols, you know, Leo, the Ram, or anything like that. Well, actually, there is actually oh, there is some there, yeah. So you can see in this particular manuscript here. So we're looking at this, uh, the constellation section, which has clearly got very visible 
uh, a, a ram in there. So that I thought maybe that might indicate Aries. Um, there's Pisces over there. Um, there's Libra, I think I saw, Virgo. So there are some oh, okay. definitely I... identifiable. There's Gemini identifiable images in here, especially in the constellation. And I appreciate it's a little bit difficult to kind of understand what we're seeing here. What we have done is I have included um, a link to the Voynich manuscript in the show notes. So we would urge you to just kind of have a look at it because it's really fascinating, um, especially while we're uh, kind of going through um, some of the details of the Voynich manuscripts. Did you have any clue as to what the hell this thing might be for yeah actually no idea i have no idea what this is <laughs> well i'm now going to tell you you can continue to kind of page through those while we go through the different sections so purely based on the illustrations um it appears that the book is divided into different chapters or sections now of course as you quite rightly pointed out the first section of the manuscript is completely devoted to plants. Now, this section contains detailed drawings of various plants, some of which uh, are a combination of different species. The attention to detail, as you can probably see, is really notable with intricate descriptions of the leaves, flowers, and the roots. Some of the plants are easily identifiable, but they are often composed of different kind of like part plants, as you kind of uh, said earlier, like a hybrid kind of plant, making and fairly alien and unlike anything that really exists on Earth, really. It's just crazy. And these root systems are just really bizarre, like nothing we've ever seen. And that looks like it's been this they, we're looking at an image of a plant which looks like it's been grafted onto like the trunk of of like a yucca plant of some kind. Yeah. Or like some octopus kind of like tentacles coming out of it. It's really bizarre. And they do all look really familiar, but nothing like we have ever seen before. So the second section of this book is completely devoted to astrology um, and astronomy. Now, there are circular diagrams with suns and moons um, that are very prominent throughout this particular section. And the language in the section is written physically in circles along the perimeters of many of the circular charts, resembling, in my opinion, Elvish, like from the Lord of the Rings. Like if you look at the, a lot of the text, it does feel like that Elvish kind of, at any moment, I feel like if I threw this into the fire, <laughs> it would just start glowing through the text and then the devil would kind of assemble. Kind of Game of minions. Thrones style. Yeah. yeah. I see what you mean, that medieval, but you said it was made in the 1400s, so that, that influenced it? Possibly, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's nothing similar. Like they've not ever found anything similar to this type of text before. Um, so there are identifiable astrology symbols within some of these charts, like, for example, the symbol for Pisces, there's a bull for Taurus, Gemini, Aries, Libra, Virgo, you name it. Um, and in each chart, there is roughly 30, mostly female and partly new drawings of people holding stars within each of the concentric circles, which is really bizarre. One thing that I did notice, and we'll come on to that, it's probably more prominent in the bathing section, which is the next chapter. Um, but you'll notice that a lot of the women seem to be pregnant as well. They've got these big, rounded, bloated bellies. And I do, and I do wonder whether or not this is something to do with it. Like, is that a thing? Especially with the charts, right? Um, a lot of these charts, because there's typically around about 30 women in these kind of these circular discs, I maybe thought maybe it might be some kind of calendar um, or like some kind of birthing chart to maybe understand oh. what your kids might be like if they were born in that month yeah, because maybe. all the women seem to be pregnant. Yeah, that that's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, I can see why you'd get, get to that. The third section is... Well, basically, it's devoted to medical baths. And this section includes drawings of people, again, mostly exclusively women. And by the looks of them, most of them do seem to be pregnant. And they're sitting in these baths, which are all oddly connected with these weird pipes that carry water to various other pools of water. And what's really bizarre is that the water seems to be this kind of green, kind of weird color. And Throughout this entire section, it's super, super dense with text, probably the most dense section other than the recipe section um, when it comes to the amount of text that's on the pages. And I get the sense that maybe this section is everything to do with the treatment of illnesses. It could even be, again, something to do with pregnant women because they do seem to have that pregnant look to them. 
Yeah, I can see they've got, it's almost like these are, um, they're not numbers, but I feel like they've numbered, uh, I don't know if they're steps or scenarios or something. That's like almost like a bullet point there, but time, in yeah. terms of just kind of how they've laid out the text. Do you know what? It kind of reminds me of The Matrix. Do you know when then those weird pods? Yeah. A little bit. Oh my God. And just, do you reckon this influenced The Blue Matrix? Blue pilling, red pilling. Yeah. Um, it could be. It's really bizarre, isn't it? It's just so alien. What could it possibly be? Uh, what could it possibly mean? So the the fourth section is devoted to cosmology, and that includes abstract drawings and several foldouts. One of the large drawings that folds out contains like this weird map of these smaller islands, and this is nicknamed the Rosettes, which contains castles, volcanoes, and it's all connected by these different roadways which kind of and it kind of resembles like a a weird map of some sort i get really the vibe of like a harry potter marauders map vibe from it definitely when you see the little footsteps walking through the castle it kind of has that weird vibe to it um and it's crazy. it's probably my favorite section um and the section appears to focus on cosmological and astrological studies by the by the from from based on the images um, within it. Now, the fifth section is completely devoted to pharmaceuticals and it includes drawings of apothecary jars and herbs uh, with short paragraphs about their medical properties, we're assuming. Um, And the drawings are detailed and include these fantastical kind of little elements such as dragons and other little small, tiny mythical creatures. Now, the sixth section is called the recipe section and that consists of just text with bullet points kind of in shapes of flowers and this section appears to be a collection of recipes um, with short kind of bulleted paragraphs describing the different ingredients that may have been used and when I'm talking about different ingredients I'm just speculating here it's just what it seems like to me. Um, The absence of drawings in throughout this entire section is really notable because every other section is just filled with drawings. That's the only section that isn't. It's, yeah. And it almost feels like it's the, I don't know. It, yeah. It's the recipes. I don't know. It just feels like recipes, you know, with different kind of bullet points or just different. It's bizarre. What do you think? What do you think based on what I've just said? Uh, yeah. So I was just taking it all in. It's all, I, I don't know. So, so these, so no one's been able to kind of work out what it is. So this is, it's just, it just, it kind of looks like a kid's book, if, if I'm modest, in terms of how they've kind of drawn, uh, maybe, you know, they didn't have art classes back then, but the, some of the drawings are very kind of amateur childlike, I feel. It could be. Do you know what? If, in my opinion, it could be. Can you imagine if it turned out to be a kid's like art project? The amount of attention that this is kind of drawn from so many different scientists across the entire world and it turns out to be a kid's project. Yeah, I feel like I've done this. <laughs> I wish you was it. <laughs> I don't know. So who who found it again? How does Well, we're gonna get onto that. Okay. So the history of the Voynich manuscript is quite long and quite a mysterious one. It stretches back to its creation in the early 15th century. Now despite extensive analysis, the author and the original purpose of the manuscripts, of course, remains unknown. However, evidence does suggest the manuscripts may have been owned by an, uh, a guy called Emperor Rudolf II of the Holy Roman Empire. And that would have been roughly around about the late 16th century, early 17th century. Now, Rudolf was known for his interest in alchemy and the occult. And he is said to have owned the Codex Digas, aka the Devil's Bible. And because of his interest in the occult, it is very possible that he would have also acquired something like the Voynich manuscripts at the time. Um, if you're interested in the Codex Gigas, then it, and it's obviously known as the, the, the Devil's Bible, it's a medieval manuscript that is believed to have been created in the early 13th century. It is one of the, the largest surviving medieval uh, manuscripts in the world, measuring roughly about 92 centimeters tall by 50 centimeters wide. So this is a huge book and it's really chunky as well, 22 centimeters thick. And the manuscript is comprised of around about 624 pages. And also it's made from vellum, which seems to be kind of the, the, the material that you would make a really important document with at the time. Now, of course, the 
the devil's bible is way more impressive in terms of the 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 penmanship or the kind of the script that she used this one feels like exactly as you said like a kid's project right yeah. it's nice handwriting but it does feel very vagabondy like someone living out in the woods kind of putting something together yeah would actually to create something like this would you have had to head money that's a good question. I have no idea. Because I'm just thinking that there's like 200 odd pages. And, and it's, it's animal all, skin, yeah. right? It's made from animal skin. That's And that's 200, yeah. How many animals had to die for you to make your little book? Yeah. I just, yeah, where it came from. So basically, Rudolph II did own several really important manuscripts. And it is rumored that he probably had owned this as well. There is some evidence to suggest that he also owned it as well. But the manuscript's ownership after Rudolf's reign is unclear. It is possible that it passed down through his family or other collectors of unusual books and manuscripts. However, the first concrete record of the manuscript's ownership comes from the 17th century when it was in the possession of an alchemist known as George Barish. Now, Barish sent a copy of the manuscript to a guy called Athanasius Kircher, who was a Jesuit scholar and a polymath in the hopes that he could decipher it. Now, Kircher was unable to do so, and it turned out that he'd almost faked his resume as well, that he was rumoured to be able to kind of translate kind of hieroglyphics and different glyphs. I say hieroglyphics, I think I just mean like glyphs and things like that, which is similar to hieroglyphics. Um, But it turns out that he just couldn't do so. Now, after Barish's death, the manuscript passed to another collector who sold it on to the Jesuits College in Frascati, Italy. Now, the Jesuits College is something to do with like the, the, the University of Jesus Christ, I think, something related okay. to that. And it's a huge number of colleges, just like Cambridge has got different schools throughout Cambridge. So imagine it's something very similar to that, and they took ownership of it. Um, so the Voynich Manuscript remained at the Jesuit College for several centuries, unknown to the outside world. It wasn't until the 20th century that the manuscript was rediscovered by a Polish book dealer, Wilfred Voynich, who acquired it in 1912. It is said that Voynich was deeply fascinated by the manuscript's mysterious content and spent many years studying it, trying to decipher its text. Now, one of the most intriguing pieces of evidence in the history of the Voynich manuscript is a letter that was found inserted in the front cover of the manuscript and the letter was found by Wilfred Voynich after he acquired it and the letter was written in Latin. It was dated around about 1665 so over 100 years after the manuscript's creation and it appears to be addressed to a lawyer. So this is 1665. They had lawyers back then which just blows my mind. Wow and so it's gone from an alchemist to a sort of university type in well Italy. rudolf which is an emperor yeah then an alchemist and then to then yeah to the the university mm-hmm. um and now voynich has it so to be held at a university for so long suggests there's quite a, an importance behind it, i would have thought possibly i did get the sense that as we'll come to in a second like the when we talk about voynich and how he acquired it from the Jesuit college it will become a little bit clearer okay. um because a lot of the times these universities they collect these documents and they just remain in vaults or in cabinets for essentially centuries and they don't know that they have it or they don't always appreciate what they've got and sometimes it just gets forgotten right okay. this is where it stayed for the longest time okay um which is interesting so as we said, the letter was over 100 years old because um, it was dated 100 years after the manuscript was created and it was addressed to this lawyer named uh, Johannes Marcus Marcy. Now, Marcy describes the manuscript as a ciphered book and it's this guy that suggests that it had belonged to Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor that we talked about earlier, which is mad because without this letter that was conveniently found, we would have centuries of unknown history about this document and it was just a letter that was just tucked in and you got to think like how often do you would you like open up a book and like let's find a little note or a post note which is a really important at the time like to let's say generations later on that would be a really important clue to the provenance of something and you might just open it one day and go oh we don't need this it's got nothing to do with the manuscript. just someone's shopping it. it's a shopping list yeah and this is in this case, it was a letter, but yeah. someone could easily have just discarded that. So the yeah. fact that it was still stuck inside inside of the manuscript, and if you're a pessimist, conveniently found inside the manuscript, then I mean that tells a different story, which we'll come on to in a moment. Okay. But, but I just think that's incredible. 
I'm going to start leaving little notes in all the books that I read now. Do you think? And then yeah. people, yeah. Just in case, you know, it goes to a shop or, you know, after I'm gone and someone reads it, then I'll create this a magical and wonderful tale. Imagine though, like if you did leave a little note in a book and then you did pass away and your family members found it, how sweet that would be. Oh, anyway. <laughs> so as I said, it's completely mad. Um, because without that, we wouldn't have the provenance linking the manuscript to Rudolf II, um, which would result in centuries of missing timeline. Now, Marcy also suggests that the manuscript may have been created by an English philosopher and statesman, Richard Bacon. Now, Richard, he's an important guy, and he could we could probably do an entire episode dedicated to him, but he was a 13th century English philosopher, and a Franciscan friar. Now, this is where it's starting to get fishy, all right? Because for me personally, um, even though Voynich acquired the manuscripts, he did live in England for a long period of time. And Roger Bacon is an English guy as well, quite a famous philosopher. And because Voynich had the manuscript when he was living in England, it made me wonder whether or not he maybe orchestrated or faked that letter in okay. order to increase its value, connecting it to someone that would be well known within the English kind of philosophy, university kind of sphere, and then or in order to sell it. So my little brain way, like my little spidey sense is going off. But there is no evidence to suggest any of that's true. As, 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 but um, it's just convenient. Have others suggested that or is this... Well, when we get onto Voynich, he I'll explain something. It might make a little bit sense. Is he a shady I'm, character? He's not a shady character because he seems to be fine, but we'll see. Okay. Right, let's continue. So Marcy's letter also provided some details about the manuscript's history, stating that it had been passed down through various owners before coming into, uh, into his possession. He notes that one of the previous owners was a man named Jacobus de Tepenesi. Who knows? Great pronunciation. Thank you very much. I've been practicing. Um, who said to have been? Who was said to have been the physician of Emperor Rudolf II? Whose signature is also said to be visible under ultraviolet light within the pages of the manuscript. But before we complete the timeline, because we're now up to the the, the early twentieth century, let's discuss Wilfred because I think he's really important. Because of course, this is where the manuscript gets its name from. Yeah. So a little background on Wilfred. Um, is that Wilfred Voynich was a Polish-born book dealer and a collector who lived in England in the tw early 20th century. Now, he was born in Lithuania in 1865, um, and he was a scholar and an avid collector of rare books and manuscripts, and was particularly interested in related works to cryptography and various secret writings and things like that, so books in that kind of area. He was said to be very lucky in acquiring various rare manuscripts and books, which may be, of, may be of importance later on when we discuss some of the theories about the manuscript's origin, because it could be that he hoaxed it. Is this a hoax from him? I know that carbon dating has proved that it is definitely legitimate, but could he have used ancient materials to put this together? I don't know. Could the, the vellum be from that era, but the writing not? And so they've never found any other books with this type of text well i mean in terms of this particular style like with these different kind of chapters that are related to various things that's quite common of the time of the medieval period that's not unusual for like anthology not anthology but like encyclopedias and right like those types of things so this isn't out of the ordinary um so and there are other things that exist like it but this is unusual because they can't break the code of what this text says um, which we'll be getting into in just a little bit when we go through the theories. But when you were a kid, did you like make up like a language or try to make up a language? Yeah, for did, sure. So could this just be what someone's done between think, two friends? But the thing is, they can't break it. They can't break the code. Some of the best scientists have worked on this and they just can't understand what they're saying. So they need a Rosetta Stone for this. Exactly. Remember, there's 30 pages that are missing that could potentially hold the secrets to what this says. Someone's ripped them out intentionally. Possibly. Scandal. Yeah. Scan it's scandal. <laughs> um, in 1912, Voynich acquires the Voynich manuscript, 
which had largely been unknown to the outside world for several centuries. Now, rumors of the manuscript existing would have been known to Voynich at the time, who had been searching for it for several years and was excited to have finally have acquired it into kind of his, his library or his kind of book list, if you will. Now, Voynich acquires the book from the Jesuit college, who at the time were attempting to raise money by selling off some of their artifacts, if you will. So Voynich purchased the manuscripts along with several other manuscripts uh, and artifacts under the terms of absolute secrecy, never revealing the source of the seller. Interesting. Now, Voynich did spend many years trying to uncover the secrets of the manuscript, trying to decipher it, studying it and various things, but ultimately he was just unsuccessful. Now, despite his inability to decipher the manuscript, Voynich's acquisition of the the book, essentially, is a significant event in the history of the manuscript as it helped bring the manuscript to the attention of scholars and the general public. Now, Voynich's interest in cryptography and secret writing also helped to fuel the growing interest in the manuscript, which continues to this day. Now, after Voynich's death in 1930, the manuscript passes to his widow, Ethel Buhl. Um, I don't know if you care or if you know, but Ethel Bull, her father was George Bull, who invented Boolean algebra. So okay. when you have, I think that's all about like true and false, on and off, I think all of that stuff. Right, okay. Um, so Voynich, obviously the, the Voynich manuscript gets passed on to Ethel, who passes it on to her friend Anne Nil following her death, who then sells it to an antique bookseller, Hans P. Krauss, which is, you can see his name in the very front cover. Um, who then struggles to sell it and ends up don- uh, ends up donating it to the Yale University and it now part of their rare book and manuscripts library and that was back in 1969 where it remains to this day. What do you think is the most plausible theory in terms of what this is? Um, it feels like someone's logged something down, reference, like you said, it's kind of whether it's recipes or something it's a knowledge book it's it's there to kind of pass on knowledge the bit and obviously there's things that we recognize with um the the horoscope symbols um we don't necessarily know what it's trying to explain but the bit that just i think if the bit that throws me off the most is the drawings of the plants or what you know what we assume are plants because if there are plants that we'd recognize then we'd probably not probably think as much of it but yeah. because they're so creative in a way yeah unless they've all become extinct like what, and there's the also point? i mean apart from that one observation that we saw where it looked like it was a hybrid or a rootstock none of the other ones seem to indicate that they are hybrids or combinations of different plants they like where people are taking the rootstock in this one put the plants the the, the head of that the, another plant on top of that there's no evidence of grafting so these look like they're, they're genuine plants that someone's depicting right these alien plants it's just such a mystery it's crazy but let's go through some of the theories because i have seven here seven seven theories seven popular theories obviously we're going to start with the first theory which is of course that the manuscript was created by extraterrestrials so (laughs) one of the Aliens. aliens. I'm not saying it's aliens, but, but it's aliens. It's aliens. So one of the most bizarre theories regarding the Voynich manuscript is that it was created by aliens. This theory suggests that the manuscript contains advanced scientific knowledge that could have not been known during the time that it was created. Supporters of this theory argue that the symbols and illustrations in the book resemble those found in crop circles, which are believed to have been created by aliens. However, this theory does lack any concrete evidence and is usually widely uh, kind of discredited by the scientific community. I was going to say, because these aliens that have come from another planet and they're they're documenting this on some dead animals. Yeah, gross. I I feel, I mean, sure, they've got to like use the resources they have, but... Hey, but maybe, I mean, the fact that this has been around since the, 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 the 15th century and it's written on this vellum, maybe that was, they knew that this is the, the, the one thing that could, it could last on until we get to the modern age and then we could then digitize it. 
maybe that was the best material at the time for these aliens. But maybe. But uh, also, if unless they, they're stranded and this is they want to like note stuff down from back home, I, I don't. Yeah. But then it's not from back home because they're like you said. There's bits of uh, there's symbols stuff that we recognize here. Mm, yeah. And no, I don't think it's aliens. Okay, so theory two: the manuscript was created by a time traveler. Supporters of this theory argue that the book contains illustrations and knowledge that were not known during the time that it was created. Uh, they believe that the author was a time traveler who visited the future and then returned to the past with advanced knowledge. However, this theory is also lacking any solid evidence um, and is not really taken seriously by any scholars. Now, let's move on to what I think is probably the most plausible and, I, and I'm sad to say it because I don't want it to be a hoax, but theory three is that the manuscript is a hoax. And this theory suggests that the manuscript was created as a fake historical artifact to deceive or defraud collectors or scholars. Some researchers have suggested that the manuscript might have been created in the 16th or 17th century during a time when there was a high demand for such artifacts amongst collectors and scholars. One of the main arguments in support of this theory is that there is no clear historical record of the manuscript before the 20th century because that letter is just a letter, right? It's written in Latin. We understand what it says. Yeah, so I found that interesting. So the people have also speculated that Wilfred Voynich may have created the manuscript along with the, the note that he found in the inner cover of the manuscript, which links back to Rudolf and in turn, Roger Bacon. The claim is that doing this would elevate the, the Voynich name and drive up the manuscript's value and also subsequent other kind of artifacts that have been connected to Voynich himself. Wilfred did have a reputation for being extremely lucky, in inverted commas, in inquiring various books which raise questions around how much of this was luck and how much of it was just him being a little hoaxy pokesy? That's interesting. But then there's a lot of effort. If it's 200 pages, and mm. has it, if, like what you'd look for, I guess, with the text is um, patterns and the same yeah. words, essentially. Yeah. So if that's happened, then there's a lot of thought that's gone into this. And But then the paper you mentioned, or what it's been well, that's it. is old. I mean, what... unless he's found a blank book that he's then doodled in. But then what surely the the actual text or the ink they'd be able to tell if that's old well they have carbon dated it and of course the carbon dating does prove that that the hoax theory is unlikely because it's pretty damn accurate they can do that within a 20 odd year period yeah. um, also the manuscript is also error free all right now that's important um mm. because this could also indicate that the author was very meticulous in writing down his thoughts or like the recipes and stuff if this is a one-off there would be if this was me there'd be scratching outs everywhere there'd be like kind of like missing words i'd be like putting a little thing the umlauts in there all sorts of things i'll be so many things be crossed out um and the fact that there's no evidence of any errors across this manuscript is really intriguing as well and so it suggests that if the goal was to deceive then the errors would have been like deemed irrelevant to correct yeah um and to fix them so i mean that's in support of it so because it's all handwritten this would have taken some time and, and drawn and so it it does i can see what you mean it this is someone i feel like a lot of love's gone into this and so therefore they perhaps would have taken their time yeah so the concepts of entropy in science can also be applied to linguistics, and it has been observed that many languages have a certain degree of entropy. In the case of studying this manuscript, uh, it has been identified that the entropy present in, is similar to that of the English language. Now, this implies that the language within the manuscript, even though we don't know what it says, but its structures and the word structures and things like that and the way that it flows, um, further suggests that there is actual meaning to the text on these pages. 
There's also distinct patterns throughout the manuscripts as well. The words throughout the manuscripts seem to have these really set defined patterns with many of them starting and ending in similar ways and in predictable groupings with certain words. This indicates that the text could potentially be a real life language. So proper nouns are used throughout the manuscript, which further suggests and supports the theory that this is an actual language. So for example, if the manuscript features an image of, let's say for example, a coriander plant on the in the plant section, the word coriander would expect to be appearing at the beginning of the passage or throughout, right? So they will see like certain words would appear on certain pages. When you look at the astrological section, there might be certain words that only appear in that section, which wouldn't appear in the plant section. And right. there does seem to be that, that makes sense. grouping of the various words ascribed to various sections, which again further reinforces this idea that this is a language because it's referring to these proper nouns that are on the page and depicted by these illustrations. So yeah, I think, I think yeah, that's quite plausible. What do you think? So this, well, yeah. So I've gone from believing, well, it might have been aliens. It's not aliens. It could be <laughs> fake. Oh, it's not fake. It seems pretty genuine. So I'm not quite sure. I'm, I think I'm back to thinking it is an old book. Yeah. Well, theory four says that the manuscript is from a lost language. And this is one of my favorite theories. The theory suggests that the text in the manuscript may be a lost language. Um, it is believed that the landscape at the time that this was created would be usually plagued with like wars um, between different countries, tribes shifting and the borders changing. And due to this, it is possible that the language would have been lost over time as different kind of tribes and countries take over different areas which would have had kind of like natives living there well yeah exactly. um, we were talking the other day like how spain didn't exist and how italy didn't exist before a certain point and so therefore you would have these pockets of people that probably would have their own way of like exactly. doing things and then it just gets kind of taken over by this new way of thinking just like christianity coming in and kind of destroying different cultures and faiths and things like that at the time so that's plausible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, the language of the Rogo, R Rongo, 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 Rongo. Um, there are uh, a people that live on Easter Island. Do you know the one with the big old kind of the the little giant, the heads, right? Big giant heads, yeah, yeah in the middle of the uh, the Pacific Ocean. So their language um, is commonly spoken, but is very rarely written. Um, and when they discover it, they discover it on these wooden plinths on Easter Island. Now, the writing was a form of proto-writing uh, that communicated very limited information, where meaning was very much implied, pronunciation and emotions through like these shorthand texts, but it didn't tell you what they sounded like, like it just implied how it would sound like. So they think that this could be something very similar. Um, so basically, could this manuscript depict a brand new way of communicating that has since been lost to the world? That's that, yeah. That I think that's that. Now onto this theory, that does seem quite plausible and quite sad that there's no other sort of documentation of this. This is just something that's been yeah lost in time. Yeah. And then you'd think, well, how much else has been lost in terms of other languages? Oh yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. like it's crazy. Do you remember the film Arrival? No. So who was it? Oh, I think it was like Amy Adams in there. So the arrival of these aliens arrive and they all communicate with those weird circles and they were like those weird jellyfish things in the spaceship. Oh, hang on. Yeah. That was quite a new movie. Yeah, it was quite recent. Yeah. And the idea there is that they their language provided, if you understood their language, you could then comprehend a whole new way of thinking and seeing the world, which essentially unlocked the, through the language, unlocked, I think the secrets of like time travel something like that yeah that's right so something they, could, something. they could be everywhere and everything and all at once and no, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a movie <laughs> but so it's a kind of similar concept that we can't understand this because the language implies a different way of thinking that is maybe lost to the world i guess so theory five the manuscript is a medical or herbal text so some researchers have suggested that the manuscript contains information about plants, herbs, and other medical properties. 
They argue that the illustrations in the manuscript depict various plants and herbs and that the text might contain recipes or instructions for preparing those medicines. One of the main arguments in support of this theory is that the illustrations in the manuscript resemble plants and herbs um, that were commonly used in the in medieval medicine, but I see no evidence of that. All those plants look completely alien to me, unless over centuries plants, new plants evolve. Possibly, or maybe I mean, you know, the drawings and illustrations aren't probably, you know, they're not the best. So maybe we we lose some of the and actually some of the plants we would recognize, mm-hmm. but yeah. Uh, but the fact they've gone down to the root in everything. Yeah, they show the entire thing, don't they? Yeah. And like, I just get the sense like when it comes to like making potions and stuff, sometimes the roots are the really important bit, right? Yeah. I don't mean, you like. There's not many with like flowers that you'd see today. Hmm. Yeah. No. Um. Anyway, yeah. I mean, this this has been heavily criticised anyway on the grounds that. The language and the writing system used in the manuscript don't seem to kind of match any of the medical texts that are around. But moving on to theory six, another popular theory about the Voynich manuscript is that it is a cipher or a code. Now, some researchers have suggested that the text and the manuscript might be a complex code that has yet to be deciphered. They argue that the manuscript might contain valuable information or secrets that are encoded to protect them from being revealed. One of the main arguments in support of this theory is that the text in the manuscript is has a consistent structure with certain characters and symbols appearing more frequently than others. Now, there is something called Zimt's Law. In other words, there's a small number of words that appear very frequently in the text and a large number of words that appear very rarely. Um, and this seems to follow that same kind of principle. So theory seven, uh, finally, some researchers have suggested that the Voynich manuscript is a spiritual text. They argue that the manuscript contains information about uh, mystical or supernatural practices, such as alchemy or astrology. And some have suggested that the illustrations in the manuscript might depict astronomical or astrological events, um, and that the text might also contain instructions on how to perform rituals or spells. So it's witches, basically. It's not aliens, it's witches. It's witchcraft now. It's witchcraft. Wow, we've we've gone through all the different genres. Yeah. One of the main arguments in support of this theory is that the illustrations in the manuscript resemble those found in other mystical or esoteric texts from that particular era. However, this theory is also criticised on the grounds that the language and the writing system used in the manuscript do not match any known esoteric texts that are from that era. So, if it is from that era. If it is from the era. Why would you reckon it's from? Oh, no, it's I from th- the 70s. Like, yeah, my mate Jim made that. Like with some tea I'm, on I'm, some paper. Uh, yeah. Tea bags and burnt the edges. I mean, <laughs> theory eight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, theory eight. It was Jim. Um, yeah, so that's the Voynich manuscript. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. Although I kind of want to know what. That's going to be frustrating. I want to know what it is. Well, we can go visit it next time we're in Yale, in Boston. Hmm. The spirit of Massachusetts is the spirit of America. <laughs> okay, should we go? We should go. I don't know if I'm going to go just for this reason. Oh. Well, I thought you had a thirst for knowledge that only like uh, like like different weird artifacts and like meeting them face to face and like and questioning them and challenging their ideas and theories could could only satisfy. I do. But and if it's on the way to the beach. Great. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for listening to the Compendium Podcast. We hope you have enjoyed today's episode on the Voynich Manuscript. If you are interested in learning more, we highly recommend checking out the archive.org where you can find a copy and a direct link to the manuscript, which we've linked to you in the show notes. Um, There are also so many amazing podcasts on the topic which go into this really deep. Um, also don't forget to follow us on Instagram at the compendium podcast, uh, to stay up to date on future episodes, uh, or if you want to get in touch with the show, thanks again for tuning in and yeah, I guess we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye.